Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, one of our biggest concerns going all the way back to last winter and, and through spring was that we were going to see throughout this summer this kind of triple ridge pattern. Remember us talking about that one ridge here north of Hawaii, another one somewhere here in the midsection of the United States, and a third one out over the uh, open Atlantic. And now normally there are um, what we call semi-permanent high pressure cells that sit here, but the concern was when you compared them to normal that they were going to be stronger. Now we've seen that throughout much of um, June and July, which is what's pic pictured here. And it's only been as of very late that we've been able to break down uh, this uh, trough that's been just off the west coast and push a ridge in there, but it just didn't last long. The pattern has reverted back to this. And we had a lot of discussion about how La Nina was going to really influence that. But just to show you the impact, uh, this is what the anomalous winds look like. And it may look a mess at first, but it's all about getting stronger than normal circulation like this. And that's what we saw in these three areas. Now, I'm bringing this up at the beginning of our video because as I'm about to show you the new long range updates for August, which do carry once again the concern of, of ridge redeveloping in the midsection of the country, I also want to provide you with some kind of caveats to it. In other words, if it is not going to manifest itself, what would break down and what do we need to see change? That's going to be a big part of this story. Because where this landed us throughout the month of July was with exceptional drought in the southern plains and in parts of the Mid-South. Uh, and this has been um, historic. Some of the locations in through here are having uh, their driest uh, such 30-day time period in history. We've had pockets of drought develop throughout the, the western Corn Belt and of course as of late as the pattern broke down extremely heavy rains here and they've stretched all the way back to parts of Colorado with a very active southwest monsoon. More on that in just a few seconds. But as I kind of look at this whole picture of the last 30 days of where the drought has really begun uh, to develop it makes me question and this is the big question for today if the pattern reverts back to what gave us this problem in the first place the next logical question is how long does something like that last? So that's my main objective today is to answer that question. Now there's no doubt that the recent pattern shift which has pushed the big ridge into the Gulf of Alaska allowing for this broad very slow moving frontal boundary. Let me redraw that. It's kind of been more like here okay moving through the mid-south over toward the um, uh, parts of, of the eastern Corn Belt and, and the um, uh, near the Appalachian Mountains but in the Ohio River Valley and it's connected up with the southwest monsoon which has delivered extremely heavy rainfall uh, to parts of Arizona and New Mexico and Colorado. Very heavy rains at times in Colorado. Now of course the major news stories this week was um, the flooding that came in and around St. Louis. Uh, by some estimates, this we would call this uh, a one in a thousand year flood, meaning the likelihood of having one on any given day is one in a thousand, maybe it's one in 10,000. And then of course, just yesterday, the flooding that we saw from that same stalled out boundary hitting parts of Western, or excuse me, Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and this uh, did a tremendous amount of damage. But again, our big question is, with this front sagging through bringing in some relief, and of course some flooding rains to some folks, is uh, was it enough to endure the revert back to the, the pattern we're going to see because this is where we are right now so if you notice there's a ridge here off the west coast the broader trough fed by plenty of gulf moisture the lows keep curling up here and that's what's just pushing that very weak frontal boundary farther and farther to the south and again feeding it on the moisture here but as we have been discussing by the time we get out to you know next tuesday this is what the patterns reverted back to so there's a ridge here, there's a ridge here, and there's a broader ridge that's out over the open Atlantic. So the flow is now doing what it's been doing for most of summer again. So when seeing that pattern reestablish itself, we're going to ask again that question, how long? And then what does it maybe do uh, to break down and could the tropics play a role in that? Because as it stands, if we look just at the upper level height pattern going through Friday into Saturday and Sunday, we already start to see the pattern flatten out. The ridge retreats back just north of the hottest water here compared to normal in the North Pacific and troughs of low pressure by next early next week and extending through the end of next week. Let's just go ahead and stop this out. Day 10, that'd be Friday the 7th. We now are back to where we were. There's a little bit different flavor to this. The ridge has actually moved more toward the Midwest than really anchoring over the Southern Plains. But with this pattern, there will be ridge riding storms and active Southwest monsoon and probably above normal precipitation for much of the East Coast into the Southeast. So if we just look at that, this is a five day sliding window of precipitation anomalies. Just get the picture here. So our sagging front, well, it's on its way out right now, such that by the time we get into next week, and then play on out to the end of next week and the following weekend. So this would be the weekend of like the uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th. 
uh, what we now have again is that active Canadian storm track. We have the active southwest monsoon, the flow coming in and around like this, which means we'll have ridge riding storms in through this area, born on weak fronts coming from the Canadian storm track. But if you're inside of this area, the likelihood of being hotter and drier uh, returns kind of in a big way. Now, when we ask why is the pattern going back to what it's been? Well, it largely comes down to looking at the symptom uh, that's uh, that symptom of the atmospheric behavior, and that's ocean temperatures. Our trade winds are still very strong in here, where they've been strong for weeks. We have our warmest water between Hawaii and Alaska, which means we'd expect to see more ridging in place here. That would lead to troughing off the west coast and some sense of ridging in the midsection of the United States. That's been the, the, the overall story that we've had for quite some time, and it seems to just continue to be playing out given that this La Nina is still so dominant. You know, just to make a point here, I, I cannot really give the MJO any credit for this pattern because when you see the trade winds just staying in this, you know, up down position on this Hovmuller diagram, which means they're basically not moving over the next 15 days. That just tells me that that's going to have the outside effect on the MJO, keeping it from really moving in its in its major phase shift and just dominating it, keeping it here where the westerly wind bursts are coming out. Now, what all that means is I'm attributing the return to the pattern we had to La Nina more than anything else. And I don't see another cause for that. I can't find another teleconnection that would suggest that the pattern isn't going to reestablish in that way. So just looking historically, it's kind of drew on this for us. You can see two of those three ridges we're concerned about. And uh, July to September, when you pull out those years that had stronger La Niñas in late summer, you know, the driest conditions tended to be here in the Western Corn Belt. It tended to be wetter along the, the East Coast and no major anomalies along the West Coast, but an active Southwest monsoon. So we just keep seeming to get ourselves back into, into this particular setup. So what's that going to do? Well, the six days or so that we saw the heat break in the midsection of the country, while it stayed very hot in, in the southern plains and hot over at times up the east coast, and then extremely hot in the northwest, well, by the time we get out there to midweek next week, all that has shifted once again to return triple-digit temperatures back here into the western Corn Belt, but just stretching throughout the plains while the west goes over to a, about a five degree cooler than normal bias. The southeast stays hot, pockets in, the nor in New England stay warmer than normal as well, but possibly quite a bit of thunderstorm activity here, which is why we're seeing some of the cooler temperatures uh, in this section of the eastern Corn Belt. But where this heat is gonna be on, the real problem I'm seeing is that all the way out there into midweek next week, see this white contour? This represents where the uh, overnight low temperatures are gonna be over 70 Fahrenheit. And that's um, this is a tough time of year to see very hot overnight lows. It really affects grain fill for the uh, crop that's grown in this area. So what are some of the things that uh, we need to be watching that could offset this? Well, we always look to the tropics first. Um, and what we notice here is that still throughout the main development region in the Atlantic, getting into the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and then right here off of the southeast coast, for the most part, ocean temperatures are still warmer than normal. Uh, activity, though, is, is expected to be very low over the next five days. And so, therefore, we're not really going to be seeing any sort of a tropical system that could really disrupt this pattern and deliver rain as we get back into this um, very um, central U.S. drought um, preferring pattern, if we want to call it that. What is interesting, though, is that despite the warm ocean temperatures and, look, lower than normal wind shear in the tropical Atlantic, what seems to be outdoing all of this right now is best seen, I think, on this satellite animation. So this is the sun setting across the Atlantic today. And even though we have some tropical convection right down here, pretty far to the south, what you really see is all the haze from the dust. And that dust is uh, problematic for these tropical systems. It indicates some drier air uh, and just really works against uh, letting these systems really develop on these easterly waves that do roll off of Africa. But as we look at the forecast of that dust, you can see that through Friday, getting into the weekend, it's going to extend over to the Lesser Antilles, and it just keeps pushing farther and farther east. So as we work out into the weekend and start next week, we could start to see some of this dust make it all the way to Florida and certainly covering both the Lesser and Greater Antilles. But just a lot more being forecast behind that. So it's no surprise that even though as we go into the month of August, which is normally a time period of year where the tropics really ramp up, we don't have any indications, excuse me, any indications right now from um, our modeling centers of, of development. Notice there's just no low pressure tracks uh, being forecast in this area at this time. 
So I, I come back to what I wanted to talk about, that triple ridge. There's one, uh, two, and three. And as I'm about to show you the new upcoming forecast, it would be any breakdown in this pattern in August that would relieve the drought potential stress coming back to the midsection of the United States. Also, don't forget, what I'm about to show you, the models will not handle the ridge riding storms very well or the Canadian storm track or what happens downstream of them as they get over here to the East Coast. But I'll say this, if we see one of a couple of different things take place, this upcoming forecast much sure they won't verify. First, if for some reason we lose this trough again like we just did over the last seven days and we start to build some, some heat back in here or split the flow in the jet stream, then that will get rid of this ridge and we'll see more fronts slicing through like we're dealing with right now. Another possible uh, possibility, if the big subtropical ridge over the Atlantic, if it begins to migrate farther and farther into the southeast, at some point in August, we could set up a, a subtropical ridge sitting here. And in that particular case, the southeast, instead of seeing more than normal thunderstorm activity, sits under the ridge and gets hot and dry. And then a ring of fire pattern sets up along its perimeter. And that would deliver drought-busting rains to the Mid-South, the Southern Plains, into parts of the Central and Western Corn Belt. But inside of it, it would get very hot and dry. So we need to be watching for that. Um, that, that, uh, that subtropical ridge getting over to the southeast. As we stated, tropical systems are always a wild card. And remember, we can get them from the Atlant excuse me, from the Pacific to come back over Mexico and deliver moisture. So I'm going to watch out for those things. But the long range models right now, this is how they have things by mid August. There's the second ridge. The first one is here and the third one is there. So we have no indications, even as we slide through the month of August, that this pattern is going to adjust in a way to just really bring back in uh, the chances of like that big southeast ridge or moving this ridge away. What we'll end up getting out of this is an active monsoon. Flow will come over the top. We'll see some ridge riding storms. They'll cascade down into the southeast where they're fed by the subtropical high, not blocked by it. So if we come into the United States view, we flip this over to a 30 day precipitation outlook. Let's go here from the first week of August to the first week of September. Where the models are probably overdoing the precipitation is in the extent of the southwestern monsoon. As much as I would love to see this rain coming back here into parts of Texas, I think it might be a bit overdone. There will be ridge riding storms coming over the top of this, as you can see here. And those ridge riding storms will likely meet flow like this in the southeast, increasing the rainfall chances. It's right in through here that I'm most concerned about. And even an active Canadian storm track is probably biased this too dry in the forecast. On the temperature side of things, this is what we're looking at for that same 30 day window. This again would be the 7th of August through the 7th of September. And that's very just indicative of the pattern we've been in. So that's my, my latest reasoning here on, on the near term uh, forecast over the next 30 to 40 days. Happening right now though, this has been a pretty spectacular view from uh, our GO-16 satellite. We've seen very large storms hit once again the flooded areas right in here on the Ohio River. Big storms kind of running through the Tennessee Valley over to the Appalachian Mountains. And then look back in uh, Oklahoma and the Panhandle of Texas. In addition to the storms we see blowing up throughout the mountains in the west, even up here in Idaho, um, we are seeing some very precious rainfall falling in parts of the Texas Panhandle, uh, one of the driest areas in the country at this particular point. Now from there, I wanna show you where our hazards are. This is where we're watching out for flood risk, okay? Here and here. Severe thunderstorm watches in New England today, excessive, or uh, sorry, uh, heat advisory here and also in parts of the Mid-South. This is all heat advisory or excessive heat watch and we're gonna see that start to transition and change here over the coming days. But right now, in the last 12 hours, just to be able to see some of the rain getting into the very dry parts of the Mid-South and the Southern Plains uh, is great, despite some of the flooding that this is causing here where the recent rains went through. I was just thinking about it, getting a text from my good friend Jeff Tarsi. He lives uh, in and around Memphis. It says first rain they'd had in, in several weeks. Well, Jeff, we had well, there was one rain in Memphis, probably missed your house that was right here. But look how we flatlined on precipitation since the end of May very, very dry. In fact, you're only about 90% of normal after going into the month of May, well above average. And if you go south uh, and, and a bit west of there over to Tulsa, they have completely flatlined on precipitation, which is why the last month or so has been the driest on record for that part of Oklahoma. 
And even all this early rain that you see here with those high evaporation rates, a lot of that has gone out of the soil. A year ago in late June, extremely wet. Plenty of rain in July, so big difference between a year ago. So that brings us to the stats. And what you see down here is there are several places in the month of July that have had just uh, very dry conditions uh, down here. Where now that we include the flooding rains that came through parts of southern Illinois out of Missouri into Kentucky and, and southern Indiana, we have a couple of climate districts here like this one in Illinois that's now the wettest July on record. But I'll tell you, the disparity just north of this is something to see. In fact, just looking at the latest drought monitor, uh, I, I live right inside of this, and I can vouch that we've had a lot of storms miss us right in this area. But this drought monitor that was given us to us today, look at the change. Over the last week, looking at the one-week change map, we have seen another class degradation here, making it over the last two months uh, upwards of a four-class degradation in drought. So that forecast for the rain coming through there is absolutely critical, and let's now go have a look at it. I'm going to use the 12Z European today for most of our guidance because you can see that it's done a very good job this week at predicting where that front's going to be so that we get through the weekend and into early next week. Let's just stop this on Monday evening. There's a high likelihood in here of, of getting at least an inch of rainfall uh, through this, uh, this region. Now after that, the pattern begins to shift around a little bit. Remember the ridge building back in? So if I kind of rock back and forth next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, just to see it, you kind of get this sense of the flow going like that. You have the active Canadian storm track, and then you have the ridge running storms that go over the top of it. Nothing brewing in the tropics here, although there's a system over in the East Pacific. Now, if we see the details of this, let's compare our models, the GFS versus the ECMWF. And by the way, the skill score scores today for both models are the same, which means they're both picked up on the pattern about the same uh, way. So you see the low here going through Quebec into, uh, or sorry, out of Ontario into Quebec. Well, the lingering front sticks around through Saturday, so more scattered storms on that boundary. It's in both models. Playing this forward, though, into Saturday night, Sunday morning. Sunday afternoon and evening. That's the end effect here of this front. It's gonna really start to lose uh, its ground here on, on Sunday getting into Monday. Meanwhile, a little system skirts through the upper Midwest. See it right there, that would be on Sunday night. And as we play into Monday, now that front starts to move on away on its way out. The storm track sets up through the Canadian Prairie. So what you get next week is weak frontal boundaries here. They're gonna initiate storms that'll run off the ridge and the model will not see them very well as to where they're going to go. It just can't pick up on that pattern. But you see that weak front? That's what we're going to watch. Meanwhile, southwest monsoon grows. Scattered convection shows up in the southeast. It's in both models. As we play the sun out to the end of this seven-day time period right about here, we can see the effect of this new pattern really taking shape. Now, as we stated, going into week two, the ridge axis sits right in through here. The flow comes around. Canadian storm track, as we discussed, Weak frontal boundaries, storms run over the top of this ridge. So active southwest monsoon, storms run the ridge, daily convection in the southeast. That's the story that I'm painting. And you can see that here by looking at the week two precipitation anomalies. Inside of the ridge is where we're going to have isolated convection, running its outer edge a lot more scattered convection that's going to follow the flow around it. And there's that active Canadian storm track. Still, just so you see here, model's not picking up on any tropical development whatsoever out that far. Uh, that's of any sort of reliable nature. So let's finish this up with temperatures and a quick international look, and I'll be done today. So here's the Thursday's highs. We've already seen these. But to get to that heat, we've got to get through Friday into Saturday. So the heat is still on in the northwest through Saturday. Once we get past Saturday into Sunday, it starts to cool off in the northwest. The heat spreads with the ridge into Montana, eventually into the plains. And by the time we get out there to Tuesday and Wednesday, that's when we're in this new pattern we've been discussing. The models keep it around. If you watch this five-day sliding window, they do not sense or they're not picking up yet on anything to be disruptive to that triple ridge pattern we talked about in the beginning. So as we play out here through the first week and second week of August, you notice how it keeps the pattern very similar to what we discussed. Now, we're out here two weeks in advance, and I showed you that what could break down, what we need to watch to see break down. So we'll keep an eye on that. But there's strong evidence that the pattern we're getting ourselves into, uh, which is this one, might stick around well into the month of August. On the temperature side of it, uh, just want to make a point here. 
Uh, CPC updated this today. Again, the origin of excessive heat we're concerned about stretching through here while heavy rains from the monsoon are there. And this region that's been dry in parts of Iowa, they are expecting rapid onset of, of drought, the risk of that at least being higher than normal. And these are the outlined areas they've looked at from the 5th through the 11th for the uh, probability of seeing uh, hazardous temperatures on the excessive heat side of things. So that kind of gives us that picture. Very quickly to finish this up, internationally on temperatures, there is another heat wave moving through parts of Western Europe. They've had about as many of these as we've had in the central United States. Uh, we'll look at the precipitation in just a second. But it's going to be hotter and drier in central uh, China right in through here as well. Same thing for much of Australia as they're moving into the middle of their winter. One thing to note, though, in Argentina, I put this in my report this morning, the drought that's been uh, going through parts of Argentina, there's some better rainfall coming through there right now. In fact, let's finish up with that map. You can see some rain coming through southern Brazil into Argentina. But down into Buenos Aires, this area has been extremely dry over the last two months, and there's concern that they're going to continue to stay dry as they progress to their, new, uh, their next growing season. The storms you see across the Sahel in Africa, this could be the beginning, kind of seeding some uh, tropical systems when we get rid of that dust, but that's what I'm keeping an eye on right now. But notice, through parts of Central and then Eastern Europe, better rains are forecast from the European model, while in Central Asia, really in China here, excuse me, we are expecting along the Yangtze River very dry conditions. China has flip-flopped back and forth on their precipitation pattern all summer long, and it's very difficult to kind of assess what the quality of the crop looks like there. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's been smooth. That's just something to think about here. Okay, I'll keep analyzing it. I'll correct again uh, next Monday. Until then, have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.